The 10 reasons why SmackDown Live fucking sucked. Let's talk about it. You know, the one thing I enjoy doing, the one thing I enjoy doing is taking all the negativity that was thrown in my direction, this week especially. I love taking all the negativity thrown in my direction, and I love turning it around and using that as fuel to make a video. I have never been overly criticized for what I think of a show more so than what happened on SmackDown. Never. And I've been through many a shows, man. Royal Rumbles, WrestleManias, SummerSlams, you name it. In the last three years, I covered it and gave you my opinion on it. But that's the, th that's the thing. I come on here and I give you my opinion. And it's always, 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 always something that makes sense. Always. Whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I always make sense of everything that I'm talking about. The one thing that I cannot stand is stupidity. And stupidity will not be tolerated on my channel, in my comment section, on my Twitter. I will get rid of you. No matter how long of a fan you've been of this channel, no matter if you're a troll just starting out and you have a fucking picture of an egg on your Twitter. I do not care. I do not care. You will be benched. That's it. I do not stand for stupidity. I've had people come to me complaining about my Eva Marie, man Eva Marie rants. I've had people come to me telling me that Eva Marie is deserving of a WWE Women's Championship reign. I've had people come to me and tell me Mauro Ronaldo genuinely sucks as a commentator. Benched. That's stupidity. Please, save us the words that you form up here and that come out through here, or on here, and go to someone else's channel and do that. It's not going to be tolerated here. I went on the Reddit forums and the Squared Circle forums on Reddit, and I seen things that just boggled my mind. I seen things in which people were complaining about me. J.D. from New York was mentioned on the Squared Circle forums following SmackDown Live. I must have hit a sensitive nerve somewhere with one goon and it trickled down into a discussion with three or four other goons on Squared Circle. It was a very small portion of their forums via SmackDown Live, but it was four people who just really confused the living shit out of me. Now, I've always been told by my colleagues on YouTube and just close personal friends, if people are talking about you in that way, you must be doing something right. And I firmly agree with that. I totally agree with that. But the thing that bothers me is not the fact that they're talking about me, because I know they're wrong. I know they're wrong. What bothers me is the level of stupidity showcased without them even knowing they're showcasing such stupidity. How can you complain about me and what I do and what I say and what I do on my Twitter and what I do on my channels as far as video goes, but you don't complain about the show we got on Tuesday night? Where was I so off in my description and review of SmackDown? Where was I off? Where was this disconnect? I'm still trying to figure that out. So, things like that, and the shit that I've seen in my comment section over the last day or so, really give me fuel to make a video. And that's exactly what this video is about today, okay? I am not here to be Mr. Know-It-All. I am not here to brag about how right I am, because I'm not right. I'm not right. I don't stake claim as being the almighty fucking WWE king here. I do what I do to open eyes and to show you exactly what you are watching. If you are not watching the same thing, if you do not agree with what I am telling you, 
You are someone who cannot handle the truth. People want to stake claim to a channel my size, and I'm a fucking nobody. But yet you find satisfaction in staking claim that I got one over on JD. I made him feel wrong. I made him look wrong. But yet you come to me with no facts. Nothing behind the words that you're trying to show me. Nothing. And today's video is all about making sure you all understand where I came from. You, you can say that this video is about making people and everybody on Reddit who enjoyed SmackDown look like a bunch of fucking idiots. Because that's exactly what they portrayed themselves to be. A bunch of fucking idiots. Those people are the ones who take WWE shit and are spoon-fed like fucking infants because they don't know any better. They don't know any better. Where was the disconnect? I still wonder. Why are we so off with SmackDown? I'm gonna let you guys know right now. Ten reasons why SmackDown was an absolute, disgusting, vile, atrocious failure. It was a failure. I don't give a shit what anybody says. I know when I am right, and this is one of those reasons why I was right all along. Now, you know, going into this, like I said, a difference 24 hours makes. Going into this, we all thought Monday Night Raw was going to be the show that was going to flop because of the three-hour time, the three-hour time difference, right? Everybody wants a two-hour Raw, three-hour Raw, they're not going to be able to handle it with a half of a roster. And I said that, I've said that personally. WWE surprised me, okay? And I stated that this was a great show. But the true test is for them to keep it up and give us entertaining, engaging programming that we can invest our time in. That's exactly what I said. 100% truth, 100% fact in that statement. SmackDown was supposed to be the show that was going to be the one show because of many different reasons. The one show that was going to be the can't-miss show during the week. Tides have changed. After one week already, the fucking polar opposites that were Raw and SmackDown are unbelievable. Unbelievable. Whether that's attributed to Vince McMahon wanting to make Monday Night Raw as strong as possible and keep SmackDown the redheaded stepchild, I don't know. I don't know what's happening internally. But something went wrong with SmackDown this week. And it was not outstanding. It was not fantastic. It was not great. All those words can be associated with Monday Night Raw. SmackDown was a fucking joke. And these are the ten reasons why I don't expect you to understand. People like me and people with a fucking brain will understand where I'm coming from. Ten reasons why SmackDown fucking blew. Cock. Number one. The roster showcased in the Battle Royal. What is with the Battle Royals? What is with the Battle Royals? Especially on a show that has... A, dilapida a dilapidated fucking roster, a pathetic roster, in which half of the fucking battle royal was tag teams. Do I expect the Usos, Jimmy and Jay, to go get a WWE Championship match? Do I expect the Vaude Villains to go get a WWE Championship match at SummerSlam? Do I expect Kalisto to get a WWE Championship match at SummerSlam? Do I expect Victor and Connor of the Ascension, R-Truth and Goldust, Whoever the fuck else was in that battle royal. Oh, they were on Raw. But you guys get my point. You guys get my fucking point. Zack Ryder, Fandango, Tyler Breeze. Do you expect any of these guys to get a fucking shot at the WWE Championship at SummerSlam? What is the point of having a battle royal? I understand you want to try and maintain that level of interest and do what Monday Night Raw did. But don't you think an eight-man tournament that spread over this entire show giving us four first-round matches, and then bleed into next week and give us a show that we're all invested in watching already after the first week with a semi-final round of two matches leading up to the fucking finals in the third SmackDown Live episode in the new era? Don't you think that would have built a new star? Don't you think a Baron Corbin or an Apollo Crews would have benefited more from a fucking tournament than a battle royal? No, of course not. You're a fucking casual. That's why. Battle Royal was great. Battle Royals are overplayed. And I hate saying that because I love Battle Royals. 
I love battle royals where there's more than one option for a fucking winner. Battle royals are only good, and this is a truth, this is a truthful statement. Battle royals are only good when there's at least five, six, or seven, a, a, a handful of guys that you could potentially believe could win it. When you have one man in a battle royal and you already know he's going to win this thing before the bell even rings, that's not a battle royal. That's called a waste of my fucking time. So the battle royal showcased absolutely nothing. It showcased how weak the roster was on SmackDown, and it was a waste of everybody's fucking time. Number two, continuing with the battle royal, WWE drafted Mojo Rawley from NXT, right? NXT upstart, NXT hopeful, making his main roster debut. He debuted at Battleground confronting Rusev, but that really doesn't count. That really doesn't count. He wasn't on his exclusive brand. So what does WWE do? Instead of giving Mojo Rawley an introduction and a promo package before he was introduced to the WWE Universe on SmackDown, before he even made his ring entrance, what do you do with him? You put him in a battle royal. What a shit way to make a debut. One of your rising stars, and I use that term incredibly fucking loosely, Rising stars on NXT, right? Mojo Rawley. You want to give him a proper debut. You don't have him debut in a battle royal. He was swallowed by that entire match. Nobody knew who he was. He was just another body in there to fill out the field of fucking nobody. And you wasted a debut. An in-ring debut for Mojo Rawley. Why? Is that all he's worth? So my mindset going into this by typical WWE standards, is that Mojo Rawley is not worth a debut match on SmackDown. His debut came in a losing effort, in a battle royal, and I didn't even see him get eliminated. That's what I seen. But I don't expect you, the fucking casual, to understand that. You dropped the ball with your NXT draft pick, Mojo Rawley. One of six NXT draft picks that were drafted... Waste him away, as if he was a nobody. Great job, WWE. Number three. I've said it weeks leading up to the draft. I said it following the draft, after Raw and SmackDown drafted their exclusive women to each brand. SmackDown has six women. One minus Eva Marie, because she's fucking awful. Raw has seven women. Okay, so you got five women, because Eva Marie's not a wrestler. She's not a wrestler. You can put one of those fucking dummies you find in Louis Vuitton or Versace modeling some fucking $8,000 dress, right? You could put them in the fucking ring and they'd be better than Eva Marie. Truth. You can't handle it. You can't handle it. You know I'm right. You just want to prove to me I'm wrong. Oh, JD, give her a chance, man. Give her a chance, man. Give who a chance? Give your sister a chance? Yeah. Sure, I'll give your sister a chance. I gave your sister a chance two Sundays ago. She passed with flying colors. How you like that one? Eva Marie sucks. I want you guys, seriously, I want you guys to go back on the WWE Network. Go back on the WWE Network and watch Eva Marie's match. The last match that she had. The last match that I hopefully ever see her in against Asuka. 15 minutes, I wanted to fucking gouge my eyes out. I would have rather been blind than watch that match. And they made you believe Eva Marie was getting one over on Asuka. 15 minutes. What am I watching here? Corey Graves pandering to Eva Marie, and I love Corey Graves. It was nauseating, but I still love Corey Graves. 15 minutes of making me try to believe Eva Marie can hang with Asuka. She's moving as, she, as if she's moving in quicksand, as if she's fucking chasing the mummy in the movie with Brendan Fraser, and she tripped and fell into a fucking pit of quicksand. That's how she was moving. Awful. Eva Marie and Asuka for 15 minutes? Meanwhile, we all know that Asuka can beat her in fucking 45 seconds flat. Probably even less time than that. She's awful. Five women on SmackDown. Where am I going with this? Five women on SmackDown. Seven women on Monday Night Raw. What does WWE do? Women's repetition already. 
right? Because we were so, we were so excited coming out of Battleground to see Natalia versus Becky Lynch. What does WWE do? Good old-fashioned 50-50 booking. We were so excited coming out of Battleground that we wanted to see it again. We couldn't wait to see it again. WWE books it again. New era. Fresh matchups. New opportunity. Really? Natalia versus Becky Lynch. You could have put Natalia versus Carmella. You could have put Natalia versus Alexa Bliss. You could have put Alexa Bliss versus Becky Lynch. What happened to opportunity? What happened to showcasing the new era? Women's repetition already, and we're not even past week one. You mean to tell me you're going to keep this division fresh, right? Already, failure. Nobody gave a shit about the match. Nobody gave a shit that Becky got her win back. Nobody gave a shit. But SmackDown was outstanding. SmackDown was great. SmackDown was fantastic. Sure. I have Eva Marie listed here, but we already incorporated our Eva Marie chant, so that's four reasons. I'm not going to go over again because I, I want to enjoy my coffee. I don't want to vomit it up. Number five, Miz TV. New era, right? New era. New opportunity. New opportunity. Who booked this show? Seriously. Did Vince McMahon and WWE Raw Creative get drafted to SmackDown? Why are we seeing Miz TV in a new era? I don't understand it. Miz TV. You know who his guest is? Himself. Yeah, but we couldn't get an Alexa Bliss match. We couldn't get an American Alpha match. You, you, you were better off playing the fucking Shelton Benjamin coming attraction six times in a row over this Miss TV segment. I, don't, I would have enjoyed that more. Miss TV, his guest was himself. Okay? Miss TV, talking segments on the new era, right? Yeah, some new era. Number six, Randy Orton is the guest after the fact on Miss TV. Okay? So, this leads to a match, and Randy Orton, this week, has stayed claim that he's taking Brock Lesnar to Viperville. Pandering to the fucking six-year-old clown sitting front row, Viperville. Such a cheesy fucking name for someone who literally is as sadistic as the next guy when he's a fucking heel. See, when Randy Orton is a heel, he's watchable. Randy Orton has a face, smiling, high-fiving fucking kids in the crowd. It's not what I want to see. Randy Orton is a vile, venomous individual. Having him portrayed on television, sending everybody to Viperville. Not what I want to see. It's not what I associate with the new era. We already have Roman Reigns, John Cena, and we don't need fucking Vi uh, Viperville. The Roman Empire, the Sea Nation, and now Viperville. Please, give me a fucking break. There's another thing people did not notice went right over your fucking head. But you're a casual, you're a casual goon. RKO. Randy Orton State claimed that all it does, or all it will take, is to send one RKO straight to Brock Lesnar, and that will send him right to Viperville. One RKO. One RKO will send Brock Lesnar to Viperville. Whoever scripted this line obviously is a fucking retard. One RKO will not level Brock Lesnar. Two RKOs, three K RKOs, six RKOs, nine RKOs will not level Brock Lesnar. But, this is where it goes right over your head, you fucking casual. Randy Orton delivered one RKO to The Miz. One RKO. Miz laid there for two and a half minutes. Match went five minutes. He delivered one RKO. Miz was laid out two and a half minutes. What does Randy Orton do? What does Randy Orton do after the Miz gets up from the first RKO? He delivered a second RKO. It took, it took two RKOs to beat the Miz. So by my calculations, the Miz is greater than... Than Suplex City. The Miz is more powerful than Brock Lesnar. The Miz now is going under the moniker of the new Beast Incarnate. 
But I don't expect you to understand that. I don't expect you guys to watch SmackDown and see what I'm seeing. Because you're a fucking casual. That's all there is to it. I'd love to tell me, I'd love for someone to tell me where I'm wrong so far. You can't. You can't. Number seven, the Intercontinental Champion. Or the Intercontinental Championship that is now absolutely fucking destroyed following SmackDown Live. But you're okay watching SmackDown because it was fantastic, right? You don't give a shit about anything on the show as long as it was fantastic. Intercontinental Championship held by The Miz. Second most important title in the WWE. Second most important title on SmackDown. But you just fed the Intercontinental Champion to Randy Orton in five minutes. Two and a half of which he was laying on the ground from one RKO. So the Intercontinental title is still important to you people, right? The Miz is a great Intercontinental Champion, right? Why is the Intercontinental Championship in a five-minute squash match? Why is your Intercontinental Champion losing in five minutes on SmackDown? Why is he eating two RKO's on SmackDown? Either you take the belt off The Miz and, putting on, and put it on someone that's not going to be a certified jobber, or you treat The Miz like a fucking champion. One or the other. It's not that difficult. But again, I don't expect you to know that. Number eight, no American Alpha. Well, I don't know. First impressions, you only get one. Monday Night Raw came out swinging for the fences. We didn't see Finn Balor not once, but fucking twice on the show. And you can't give me American Alpha? Yeah, I'm sure Eve Marie parading, stripping, and all the other women fucking bullshitting... And a Miz TV segment that went fucking 20 minutes is more important than debuting your best tag team in WWE. No American Alpha? What happened to you only get one first impression? What happened to putting your best foot forward? No American Alpha? You could have easily gave me American Alpha versus The Ascension. I would have been pleased. They should have got 10 to 15 minutes. Show me what type of shit you're working with in the tag team division. Nothing. You saved them for week two. But by that point, it's too late. Because this show was a fucking failure. No American Alpha. JBL. Do I even need to say anything about JBL? The worst color commentator in history. Guy's fucking terrible. Absolutely fucking terrible. And this is the kicker. This is the kicker. I'm going to go over all this shit with you guys right now. Because you all came down on me. You wanted to fucking nail me to the cross. Because I didn't want Dolph Ziggler to win. I didn't like Dolph Ziggler winning and getting a WWE Championship match. I'm going to shut you all up right now. And I'm going to change your perception of that title match at SummerSlam. Is it going to be a good match? Yeah, it's going to be a good match. Because Ziggler is great in the ring. That's what you don't understand. That's what you don't understand. Am I enjoying Dean Ambrose as WWE Champion? Yes, I am. I think he deserves it. Hardworking guy. Glad he's getting a fucking legit run with the title. Let's go back to 2015. Only a year ago, because all I need is one year to show you and prove to you that Ziggler does not belong in a main event at SummerSlam. Ziggler became involved in an on-screen love affair with Lana, the former manager of Rusev, when she kissed him at Raw on May 25th, 2015, with Lana serving as Ziggler's valet during his matches. During this time, Ziggler started incorporating elements of 80s glam, rock fashion, into his entrance and ring attire. Typical of 80s bands like Motley Crue and Poison. In June, after Ziggler and Lana confirmed their storyline relationship, Summer Rae aligned with Rusev to even the odds. After an attack by Rusev, Ziggler suffered a bruised trachea in storyline, which was to give him some time off to film a new WWE Studios movie entitled 642. Ziggler then returned in August on the 17th episode of Monday Night Raw, aiding Lana during a confrontation against Rusev and Summer Rae. This altercation prompted a match between Ziggler and Rusev six days later at SummerSlam, which ended in a double countout due to interference from Lana and Summer Rae. In a rematch on September 20th at Night of Champions. Neither man, neither man was a champion, so why the fuck why the fuck they're fighting a night of champions is beyond me. Ziggler emerged victorious on October 11th when TMZ reported the real-life engagement of Rusev and Lana. This officially ended this 
piece of shit feud. The following night on Raw, Ziggler unsuccessfully challenged John Cena for the WWE United States Championship. Aw, poor baby. On the October 22nd episode of SmackDown, Ziggler started a feud with Tyler Breeze, who aligned with Summer Rae and attacked Dolph Ziggler. Entered a tournament for the vacant WWE World Heavyweight Championship, Ziggler did, defeating The Miz in the first round, before being eliminated by Dean Ambrose. Ziggler and Breeze continued their feud, which culminated in a match between the two at the Survivor Series, which Ziggler lost. The next night on Raw, Ziggler teamed with Dean Ambrose to defeat the team of Tyler Breeze and Kevin Owens. On the November 30th episode of Raw, Ziggler defeated Breeze in a singles match to end this feud. Pointless. Breeze and Summer Rae split up on 2000, in 2015 in December, putting that love quadrangle to rest. On the December 18th episode of SmackDown, Ziggler defeated Kevin Owens via countout victory. Owens interrupted Ziggler at the 2015 Slammy Awards where Dolph was presenting awards. The two ended up getting into a brawl and a match later on was made that evening with Owens picking up the victory. The two later traded victories into the New Year. Ziggler defeated Bo Dallas on the New Year's Eve SmackDown special. Some great mid to end 2016 for Dolph Ziggler, right? But he deserves a WWE Championship match. I'm not done yet. 2016, Ziggler entered the Royal Rumble as the 28th entrant. If you're coming in at number 28, you, no doubt in my mind, should be the final two. Ziggler entered number 28, lasted seven minutes, was eliminated by Triple H. The night on Raw, the next night, Ziggler faced Kevin Owens in a losing effort, but defeated him in the following two weeks to follow, and on February 15th, Monday Night Raw, Ziggler was involved in a fatal five-way match for the Intercontinental Championship where Kevin Owens regained the title after pinning Tyler Breeze. At Fastlane, Ziggler challenged Owens to a rematch for the Intercontinental Championship, which he lost. In the following weeks, Ziggler began to reignite his feud with the Authority. And on March 14th, he confronted Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. This resulted in Ziggler being granted a match against Triple H where if he won, he could pick a match at WrestleMania excluding the WWE World Heavyweight Championship match. However, Ziggler lost. At WrestleMania 32, Ziggler competed against Owens, Zayn, Miz, Stardust, Sin Cara, and Zack Ryder in a ladder match for the Intercontinental Championship, which he lost. The following night on Raw, after WrestleMania 32, April 4th, 2016, Ziggler went to a double countout with Baron Corbin, leading to Corbin hitting an end of days on the outside to Ziggler, igniting a feud in the process. At the payback pre-show, Ziggler faced Baron Corbin in a winning effort. The two then had a no-disqualification match at Extreme Rules where Corbin won after hitting a low blow on Ziggler. Following Extreme Rules on May 23rd, Monday Night Raw, Ziggler lost to Dean Ambrose in a Money in the Bank qualifying match. Earlier in that show, Ziggler had a confrontation backstage with Corbin and challenged him to a technical wrestling match the next week. In that match, Ziggler intentionally got himself disqualified when he kicked Corbin in the groin immediately after the match began. This led to a rubber match at Money in the Bank, which Corbin won, ending their feud on July 19th at the WWE Draft. Ziggler was drafted to SmackDown. You guys know the rest. Obviously, on SmackDown, Ziggler won a six-pack challenge against Cena, Wyatt, Corbin, Styles, and Apollo Crews to become the number one contender for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. He is scheduled to face Dean Ambrose at, the, at SummerSlam for the WWE Championship. So, after all that I just read to you, does Dolph Ziggler deserve a WWE Championship match? No. Does Dolph Ziggler deserve to be at SummerSlam in a headlining gig? No. Has Dolph Ziggler done anything per storyline to deserve this type of treatment? No. This is a new era. SmackDown is a brand for opportunity. That doesn't mean you automatically give it to the person that should have been given his chance two years ago. You see, when Sting made his debut at the Survivor Series and Ziggler won that big Authority versus Team Cena match and pinned Seth Rollins, we all thought Ziggler was going to finally be in the main event. Because how can you fucking overcome the odds and not be treated like a main event star following that? WWE dropped the ball. They took everybody in that match, Eric Rowan, Ryback, and Dolph Ziggler, and they fired them. 
They fired them per storyline on WWE television. But Ziggler never picked up momentum after that. And this is what it led him to. All the shit that I just read you. So I ask you again. Does Ziggler, from what we've seen this year, a year later, or, or a year earlier, I should say, a year earlier, does he deserve everything that he's getting right now? No. Everybody that came to me and said, oh, now you hate Dolph Ziggler. And I don't hate Dolph Ziggler. I hate the fact that WWE storylines are fucking illogical. Give me a break. Bray Wyatt or AJ Styles should have won this match. Because they are the ones who need it the most. Especially Bray Wyatt. I would have been more intrigued by a Bray Wyatt, Dean Ambrose WWE Championship match than anything. Ziggler, from what I just read to you, doesn't make any sense. But again, I say, I don't expect you to understand that. Thank you guys so much, and if you enjoyed the video, please hit that thumbs up. I wanted to really put everybody to rest and shut everybody up. SmackDown was awful. I hope they come out swinging for the fences on Tuesday, because they certainly need to. If this is going to continue, and if this is the shit we're going to get on SmackDown, they will be a skippable show every fucking Tuesday. Hope I opened some eyes, hope I made sense, and I hope I shut everybody up that wanted to come at me in a negative way following Tuesday Smackdown. This is what I do, bro. This is what I do. I don't watch to enjoy. I want to enjoy. I hope I enjoy. But in the end, I watch to give you guys a proper, a proper viewing and a proper opinion of WWE. That's all I got to say about that. Thank you guys for watching. Hit the thumbs up. I'll be back later. Talk to you later.